Thank you, Dr. Steiner, and thanks to Dr. Vedovich, who had to step out for their comments. Now it's time to get started. Today, we'll start the summit talking about on-farm research. You'll hear two examples where a researcher is partnering with a local farm. Research on private farms is critical to many projects. In some cases, we need specific animal numbers, housing systems, or other unique attributes that we don't have on campus. We also need to know how our research plays out in the real world. Each of our examples will have about 25 minutes. You'll hear an overview of the project from the faculty member, and then you'll hear from the farmer about their experience. Our first project is gonna be presented by Chris Wilson from Wilson Organic Farms in Cuba City, and Hal Evenson, who is a professor of engineering physics here at UW-Platteville, talking about their project involving rotational grazing. Please welcome Hal and Chris. Thank you, Dr. Montgomery. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present our project. Uh, if you're here today, you're interested in agriculture. You're excited about the future of dairy farming in Wisconsin and the region. I love dairy farming, and I also enjoy innovating new ideas and strategies to meet the challenges of tomorrow in dairy farming. Ideas that can better not just our farm, but offer opportunity to other farmers and future farm generations. Projects like this one wouldn't be possible without the support from the Dairy Innovation Hub and its supporters. Um, <clears throat> I am Chris Wilson. I'm the sixth generation member of Wilson Organic Farms. We're located between Platteville and Cuba City. Uh, currently, there are four generations on our farm today. Um, my dad, the fifth generation, and our newest, Charlotte, who's two, were both born the eighth generation were both born on the farm. Uh, so I always think that's really cool. Um, there's seven Wilson families that make their primary living off of our farm today. Uh, so at our core, we are a grazing dairy farm. We graze, we graze 500 milk cows across 250 acres of pasture converted from corn and cropland over the last 40 years. So why do we like grazing? Well, originally it started for us back in the 1990s as a means of financial survival during tough markets and, and tough financial times. We found that cows do exceptionally well in a well-managed grazing system. For example, our semantic cell count in last year averaged about 105,000. Um, our energy corrected milk on a high forage diet is in the mid 80s. Our herd productive life the life in which that cow is productive is about 30% longer than an average dairy herd. Um, grazing is also a very low cost feed, which produces low cost milk. Um, cows harvest feed, reducing the need for labor, feed storage, and equipment costs. Uh, we have a very high quality forage from that pasture, often averaging between 180 and 250 relative feed quality. It reduces the need for manure storage and spreading costs as those cows do that work for us. Uh, grazing is by far the most profitable use of our land on our farm. Um, grazing is also a very resilient system. It has helped build soil organic matter on our grid samples to between six and eight percent in many areas of our farm. Um, it increases water infiltration holding capacity, which creates a resilient productive system and continues to yield during dry and wet seasons. It reduces the need for input requirements, increases biodiversity, and produces a product that supports jobs in the region, sustains our farm with well-paying careers. So how do we do it? Well, the challenge is cows left their own devices. They'll eat the candy first. They'll go out and eat the best tasting, which are usually the highest quality uh, plants within that pasture system. So in order to control that, we use what's called managed intensive grazing. It echoes what bison and other grazing animals co-evolved with 
uh, the plants over time. So what does that mean? Well, we do this by grazing a small area and moving the cows every day or sometimes twice a day to fresh pasture, but not returning to that section for as many as 40, 50 days later to allow that pasture to regrow, increase yields and quality. Currently, we are using what's a temporary, our temporary fencing on a system with what's called tumble wheels uh, to restrict the cows to these small areas that is moved by hand on an ATV. It requires about an hour of manual labor for each one of these moves on our farm. This is where, doc, or this is where we're looking to the future. Dr. Evanson, many UWP faculty, and many, many students have partnered to remove this step of manually moving fences daily. The end goal is a tool that expands opportunity for farms of all sizes to graze and dairy successfully in Wisconsin, sustaining families and communities and the, and the environment. Thank you, and now Dr. Evanson will talk about the journey we have been on in tackling this challenging endeavor. All right, yeah, thanks Chris. Yeah, so a little bit about the project we've been doing here. And so, as Chris mentioned, our, our goal here was to come up with a cost-effective means to support rotational grazing at, at you know, the scale of, of his farm, uh, you know, a small dairy farm when you consider, like, the larger beef herds that might be out west. And so we had a target cost. Uh, there were existing systems that are out there, like I said, for beef herds in Australia and Texas. However, for the purposes here, they're, they're expensive and they're overkill. And so the question was, can we scale this down to something that would be more effective uh, for Chris? And so uh, my plan here today is to give an overview of what we've been up to for the past few years and kind of the evolution of how this problem came to be and uh, the working relationship we had with Chris to kind of help uh, better define what we were after. And, you know, it, it sounds easy to say, and this is probably one of the research projects I can talk with others, you know, that are outside the university and they understand what I'm talking about, um, but it's challenging. And so we didn't know what would work, and so to start with, we pursued a couple of tracks. And so the first one, virtual fencing, electronic dog fence, right, that kind of idea. Um, the idea, right, that's challenging, the, Chris's pasture is much bigger than a yard, um, but it's flexible. There were similar solutions already in market that we might be able to take ideas from. The challenge there, of course, is every cow could be expensive if they each have their own device. And so we also pursued a, a physical track, which would be some way to advance a physical uh, restraint mechanism. And so it would be a simpler set of system, but of course, from an engineering perspective, it has its own challenges of being out there, right? Out in the pasture, it's got to survive the environment, it's got to survive the herd. Um, and so, you know, to kind of, so the problem definition, it didn't have to be perfect, right? Chris had electric fences that were keeping the cows off the highway. We just kind of had to keep most of them where the area where we wanted them to be. Um, and this thing had to be durable, it had to be simple, so easily implementable by the staff, um, and had to give value, right? Uh, had to ultimately add value to the farm. And so to kind of describe some of the tracks, the physical fence, uh, which is where I started, uh, we had multiple faculty on this, uh, the idea was somehow we're going to automatically advance this barrier, you know, begin with semi-automation, and down the road this could perhaps be fully automated. And so advantage, the cows are familiar with a physical barrier. It's what they see every day. Uh, it was compatible with kind of how the farm was working. People had to go out there anyway and open up part of the pasture. Um, but then you see the challenges, right? From my perspective, that's a really big area, right? It's a small pasture from Chris' perspective. It's gigantic for mine. Um, so we had a large area, and then, of course, we had the mechanical issues. And so we had this evolution. Uh, we started, I started working with some students, and we kind of came up with design concepts. And like all good concepts, they only go so far, right, before you move on. But we had this idea of maybe rails advancing this electrified line. We decided to build on the tumblewheel system with that line that could be advanced. Um, then uh, we worked with the senior design team, and I thought they came up with an ingenious idea which was, you know, they're out there anyway with their ATV. What if we had carts that were being dragged? These carts could potentially be platforms for sensors if we wanted to collect data on the herd. And so we had that first prototype. And you can tell it's a prototype because you can see those wheels and you know that they wouldn't last the first rain, right? But you have to start somewhere. Uh, so then we went on from there. Uh, the future senior design teams, we came up with a, uh, a motorized cart 
kind of a semi-automatic automatic version. We also came up with a sensor suite that would be on there. So those sensors were intended to keep track of environmental conditions that the herd was seeing and would also be a, a hub, if you will, that could collect data on the animals. And um, then uh, we kind of, right, we want to get more semi-automated, and so we moved on to a kind of a GPS-guided version where the cart could go to a pre-programmed GPS point, the, the thought being that we would have those pre-programmed points throughout uh, the pasture. And we did, we got that sensor system from a shoebox down to something that would fit into a hand. Um, and then uh, we went on and, you know, you, you get, students onto something, you show them what was done before and they are bound and determined to do better, especially like the industrial technology management students want to show they can do better than the engineering students and so they built uh, this one. It looks like it could win a, win a war. Um, so it had improved stability, as you can see, better agility, uh, better weatherproofing, and so the plan was to field test that uh, in uh, summer 2022. Okay, so that's, that was kind of that first physical approach and uh, to put a pin in that and just shift gears for a moment to talk about the other approach, a colleague of mine in electrical engineering uh, started on this path was the virtual fence. Um, so the idea here was uh, the user would draw, could draw a map, right, could draw on a, a map using a web browser interface, and those coordinates could be pushed to the herd, and the herd would have these smart tags or something that would know where they were, and then the collars would alert or dissuade the cow from, from leaving the boundary. So, of course, advantages here, you could use this on any terrain. It would work around trees. I know tr Chris has a long-term goal of maybe getting, you know, some of the more trees back into the pasture. If you had a ravine, it could make it usable land for grazing now. Uh, also, the advantage of data collection on each animal, right? The more data we get, the more we can make decisions about breeding and, and things of that sort. Uh, physical implementation was light. It was just something on the cow. And there is prior art out there to build upon. Uh, of course, cost and complexity are challenges. And as we've learned, uh, power supply is uh, one that we really can't ignore. And so as that progression, it started by putting a fence around his house in Fitchburg. Uh, and so he was able to kind of track, you know, if the collars left around his house. And then we built up to our prototype version that was uh, perhaps too heavy for a cow's neck. But uh, we did then shrink it down to, to hand-sized. <clears throat> and so this had a GPS unit. The battery pack, we started with sound uh, dissuasion, figuring we'd save uh, any electric options for the future. And so that was kind of what we, where we were on the virtual fencing side. And so the plan was then in the summer 2022, we'd roll those out, see how they were implemented, and then go about learning about how they interacted with the herd, how they interacted with the pasture, okay? And then uh, reality happened, and... Um, we basically had a moment with all of them, as you can see from their little icons. Uh, it was a learning experience for all of us, okay? Uh, we get these things in the field, and Chris sees them, and he's like, oh, that's way too low. That'll never clear the grass in spring. I'm like, oh, oops, right? Um, you know, the motors that we had worked for driving across campus and driving across the field in November, but they weren't going to work uh, the rest of the year. And then we realized, too, because uh, this evolved for us as well as for Chris, he's like, well, you know, at the end of the day, I want data on the herd. And so we realized, well, with a physical system, you're going to get data on the herd. You're going to need some kind of a tag or collar system anyway. And so that was like another layer that would exist beyond the physical system. Uh, the collars that we had, they were too bulky. Battery life was a big deal. Uh, you know, if you have 500 cows, you cannot be recharging your 500 cell phones every day, right? One phone per person is bad enough. And so we had to deal with uh, power consumption. And then the full season durability, some of the things that cows like to do during the year horrified me, frankly. And from an engineering perspective, it's, right, it's challenging as far as the, the engineering requirements go. And so it's challenging to combine all of these things. And so ultimately, uh, you know, we, we realized that we were trying to put too many features together at once, and the truth was these things failed spectacularly. We couldn't make multiple copies of these, we couldn't implement them, and we couldn't see exactly, you know, how they were implemented. So we had to come up with, we, we took a step back, took a kind of a bigger look at the project, now with a little better understanding, I think, of what it was that Chris wanted and what the challenges were. And so, number one was the data was paramount. We needed to have a way that we could get data on the animals. 
and that could create additional value, right? So more than just doing the progressive grazing, if we had a way to get data on the animals, that's another layer of value that we could provide to the, to the farmer. Uh, implementation had to be easy. We don't want a master's degree in electrical engineering to be able to implement this thing. We want the staff and their staff turnover, so you really want to be able to minimize the training and to ease that implementation. And one big piece of that is, let's put it on in the spring and take it off in the fall and not have to deal with it in between, right? That eight or nine month stretch is a big engineering challenge, but a huge deal for simplicity and ease and practicality. Um, and then this flexibility, and we had this eye on flexibility, so this isn't a new thing, but right in the spring, that paddock might move twice in a day. Uh, in the fall, it might move once a day, right? It'll be different sizes and different seasons. And you know, we'd like to be able to adapt to trees and things like this. Meanwhile, we have to keep the cows happy, right? That's, that's job one on the farm is we need to keep the cows happy. And so with the implementation idea, that power limitation and the simplicity, we decided, well, we need to go with an ear tag type of system. This is a format that's already out there. It's used quite a bit. Uh, the challenge, of course, is power consumption, eight to nine months. It's not insurmountable, but it was a challenge. But I, I do want to say this, that it's easy to state the problem, but once we got this handle on it, it's not clear to me, even now, that a solution exists yet. Okay, um, my students are working with technologies that weren't there two years ago, and we're much closer than we were two years ago. And so I have faith, hope, and confidence that right two or three years, there's going to be products out there that could be adapted to this, that would be able to do it. So I feel like we're on a good track, but it's not 100% clear. From an engineering perspective, um, we modularize the problem, and I it's you have to go through this to get there, right? You kind of wish that maybe we'd done this earlier. Um, but there's three jobs that have to be done by our system, right? One is to monitor each cow, uh, track their motion, their behavior, and their environment. And what we just, and the real-time data wasn't really needed, right? We're, we're not tracking terrorists or something. We just want to know at the end of the day or the end of the week, where were they, what kind of conditions were they in, data that we can reflect back on. And so we said, well, there are conventional solutions out there. And so we set that aside because that wasn't really one that we felt like a solution exists and we can adapt what's perhaps out there. The next one was the more challenging one. And this is where the technology gets pushed. It's tracking each, each animal, okay? We need to have nine months of power, you know, set them up in the spring, take them off in the fall. Uh, the cows like to be out in the pasture at four in the morning. Solar isn't an option for these herds, okay? The herds that are out 24-7 out west, sure, but solar wasn't really an option for us. GPS, which would be the first thing that comes to mind, that is super power hungry. Uh, we can't do that. And the cheap GPS modules that would fit on a collar give you about three meters of uncertainty. So we don't want the cow to suddenly be in, suddenly be out, suddenly be in, suddenly be out. That's, distre that's stressful, stressful for the animal. Um, and then there's cost, of course, right? They can't each have a smartphone. And so what we're doing on that front is we're looking at a, a newer technology called uh, UWB, ultra wideband. And the concept is anchors and tags. We would have anchor, anchor points that kind of help define where today's paddock is. And then the cows each have a tag. Uh, it's by communicating with those anchors, they can figure out their relative position, and we've got some uh, kind of nice techniques to kind of uh, do that. It turns out that at first blush, the, the power part is doable. Uh, it looks like you know a couple of button cells, 12 hours a day, which is pessimistic or very conservative, would be eight months right there. And we've got other tricks that we can do to bump that up. Uh, but the realization was whatever technology we use is, is probably going to work on this anchor tag concept. We want a local system that tells us locally where the cows are. We don't care what their coordinate is on the face of the earth. We care if they're inside or outside today's paddock. And so an anchor tag system is really going to be whatever future system is built on. I'm, I'm pretty confident. Then, of course, the confining the cow. And that's the big energy challenge. Uh, existing systems uh, wouldn't even want to touch Chris's pasture because they're saying, you know, 100 acres would be the absolute minimum that they would consider because when the cow interacts with a barrier, you lose a lot of energy, right, trying to dissuade the cow. And in a two-acre paddock, forget it. It's going all the time. And so the concept, and this would be kind of a next phase as we're working on tracking right now, uh, but the concept would be, well, the tag might summon a, a sentinel, 
right? Something, a drone, a, a cart, something that kind of can collect energy, always in the pasture, might have a larger battery source, but we don't put that requirement on the cow, anything that the cow has to carry around with them. And so uh, work is ongoing right now on that middle part, because I said that's the technologically uh, pressing piece. Uh, over the years, I'm, I'm fairly pleased with this. We've had over, I, I didn't realize this number until preparing the slide, but we have, have had over 40 students working on this project in multiple capacities. I've had a number of independent study students. Uh, we've had a number of senior design teams, junior design teams, and I've hired a couple of student teams. Um, and they're from five different departments, okay? Mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, uh, industrial technology and management, and I'm forgetting the last one, oh, electrical. Um, and so that's been very, that's been good. Uh, it's presented the students an opportunity, frankly, to learn about an application of technology they would not have had without the, the Dairy Innovation Hub. And so we're very grateful uh, for the funding for the hub. Uh, this has been spectacular. The students, you know, some of them grew up on a farm, and so they loved this, this opportunity to apply what they're knowing uh, to agriculture industry. And so uh, it's, it's been a, a good experience. And so just kind of in summary before we go, go to any questions is that we did have an evolution of the project as we got a better understanding. And I would emphasize it was on both sides. I feel like Chris got a better understanding of what it was he really wanted and needed. And we got a better understanding of kind of the technological aspects. I learned so much about uh, the dairy farm. It is embarrassing, okay? Um, and as I've said here, you know, we've engaged with a large number of students I'm, I'm a professor because that's what I like to do. So if, honestly, that's been the most fun for me is having these engagements with the students, the idea generation, and helping them uh, move their designs forward. And you know, on, on what we're doing, as we, I mentioned, we're going towards this anchor tag design, uh, and we've kind of modularized the system. So I feel like now we are on, on a good path, and uh, if the technology is not there yet, we're going to be ready for it when it is soon. So. With that, I uh, thank you for your attention. I would actually throw out there that Chris has been spectacular to work with. The students love working with him. He clearly enjoys working with the students. It's been a fantastic partnership, and uh, working with Chris has probably been a, another one of the top features to me of, of having this project. So thank you very much. Hello, um, thank you very much. <clears throat> very nice, inspiring presentation. Um, I just have a question. I recently saw some studies where they are using um, skin sensors on humans to measure um, uh, body temperature and things like that. And ov obviously those are self-powered. And I thought, you know, with cows, they have much larger bodies than us and we're measuring the same thing potentially. Uh, but they do have some fur, so I, I don't know, I just have some thoughts about whether you have thought about that and what you think. Measuring. Yeah, I mean, we, we hadn't really th looked into kind of the cutting edge sensor technologies. Where we had been starting, I think, were things like accelerometers to track their motion. Um, because even with accelerometers, you know, there's systems out there now that are able to tell when the cows are in estrus and things like this. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Um, yeah, I, what, what what Hal said, as far as like the the recharging or, or you know using the body to recharge those, I mean that's an area that we haven't necessarily explored. Um, it we've kind of confined it as is you know what what can we get from existing battery technology that that would allow us to check through some of those goals, but I think to one of the overarching themes of this project is that we are constantly looking to the future and what new technologies are going to be out there and trying to position ourselves that we can evolve whatever we derive today into those future technologies to make it better. Yeah, yeah and I think honestly like the kind of the future kind of measurement that you're talking about, I think the next phase would be another ear tag that is the sensor hub, right, that kind of gets us started and then if we're looking at more advanced sensing that might, we might need to to save energy or give us more information, we would go there, yeah. Good morning, uh, Michael Gay. Um, hey, Michael. Great job, or 
Professor Evenson and Chris. Um, two questions. One is, how did this project start? Did the university reach out to the dairy industry, or Chris, did you come to the university with a problem? And then the second one is, when do you reach out to the business students and get them involved on this and see if this technology is commercializable, where the entrepreneurship kicks in, you know, the techno-economic analysis, that kind of stuff, because you're going in the right direction. It seems logical that that should be a future project. Yeah. You want to start? No. Yeah. Um, so as far as, uh, yo, know, I, it, COVID kind of is in the middle of that. So I'm honestly jogging my memory right now. I remember who reached out to who, but I know I've worked pretty closely with uh, Dr. Terry Montgomery. Um, we've worked on other projects. Uh, and I think there was, I think there was a connection with Hal and I um, and looking at some of the senior design and, and how basically the combination of the, of the Dairy Innovation Hub starting out and a lot of interest from the engineering department to get hands-on learning. Um, they were kind of a matchmaker there. And ultimately, those two things, you know, I've got ideas every day of the week. Um, <laughs> I'm excited to innovate. I'm excited to push boundaries. Um, this was one that I've been needing, you know, that expertise that the university has. I mean, we have phenomenal engineering department, UW Platteville. Um, tons of talent, and to be able to to tap into that on an idea was exciting to me. So I think probably somewhat, you know, me pushing it, but definitely it was a partnership there. Um, and then the second question, as far as uh, bringing in some of the business stuff, yeah, one hundred percent agree. Um, we. I made an attempt way too late in the summer to reach out to some of the business uh, faculty on campus, but I'm going to continue that look, looking ahead into the spring because, yeah, I agree. And we, we need to have, because I think part of that and what kind of bugged me was the cost per head, right? You know, the, the, what, what cost per head do we need? We didn't, honestly, we don't have a really good grasp on that because there could be value added with the data, which would allow that cost per head to go up. So, yeah, I agree and that's definitely on the horizon here for the rest of the academic year yeah good morning my name's travis tranel uh, first off i just want to this is probably the when i saw what we were talking about this is probably the most exciting project uh that i saw on there just because i think this technology could really be revolutionary in how we manage grass and water quality and so many other uh issues as we move forward my question, uh, sort of echoing off the gentleman that went before us, how, how closely do you work with the private sector? If everybody pulls out their phone and Googles, no fence. Uh, there, are, there are many people that are way down this road already. And as opposed to reinventing the wheel, are you working with them to try to figure out uh, how we could better improve the technology that already exists as opposed to starting from scratch when the private industry is already further ahead than this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question and definitely something that we, before, especially as we iterate out of this uh, from 2022 forward on sort of this um, virtual approach, we did a lot of exploration with those companies. And fundamentally, the difference was is they were their their tools are trying to solve a different problem and they're using similar technologies um, but they're very much focused on rangeland which is covering you know thousands of acres and you know we looked at and we talked with them about applying their technology to an area in which maybe you're grazing two acres a day or three acres a day with two or three hundred cows in that confined area and it that's where it, they just didn't, they didn't jive. They didn't work, their technology wouldn't work. For some of the same challenges that we're running into, um, they failed at that point. So we're trying to solve a problem for the dairy industry, whereas they have tools that generally are focused on, on beef herds and rangeland situations. Yeah, and we, we've reached out to a couple of them, and yeah, and that's basically what we're up against. And what we realized, kind of finally in the past year is that there's some advantages that we have to working at the s smaller scale 
it's small by the agriculture scale, uh, that make the, the system ideas that we have would not work for them, yep. right, for, the, for the, those large beef herds. I mean, in many ways, their system is focused on trying to take, you know, the cowboys off, of, you know, replace the cowboy from going out and, and herding the cattle in certain areas. That, in many ways, has been what their, no offense, vents, um, those technologies, we're really trying to apply it to, uh, you know, like our farms, like the challenges that we have where we're out there every day on ATV putting up small fences um, and then in very dense, uh, relatively speaking, uh, uh, dense uh, grazing within those areas. It really has been a, a pleasure being able to see this project grow and, and uh, expand because they started, their ideas started before the pandemic did, so it's been pretty cool. Our second project is presented by Ryan Prowley, who's an assistant professor in the School of Agriculture and one of our first hub-funded faculty hires here at uw Platteville. He's joined by Andy Buttles, a dairy farmer from Lancaster. Please welcome Ryan and Andy. All right, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan, and our project was investigating a novel blood biomarker panel predicting bovine fatty liver syndrome in dairy cows. So just want to start out with what the challenge is that this project tried to address. So fatty liver syndrome is a common subclinical metabolic disorder in early lactation dairy cows, and the key part there is subclinical. There aren't any key features that are visible to the dairy farmer as they're walking through the pen that obviously says that this cow has fatty liver syndrome. And that fatty liver, uh, pictured in the bottom left there, we have a healthy liver that's that nice uh, burgundy color. And then to the right, we have a fatty liver that's all yellow. And that's because there's a huge accumulation of triglycerides potentially uh, after calving when cows are losing a lot of uh, body weight in negative energy balance. Now, this disorder could cost the dairy industry over $1.2 billion uh, annually in the United States, but we actually don't have a very good idea on what the consequences are, how common it is, um, because it's really difficult to measure. Uh, to date, I have not had a dairy farmer that's very willing for me to walk out to their farm and start poking holes in cows trying to get liver tissue biopsy samples, which is the only way to actually do the standard tests, which would be a wet chemistry assay or histological assay, uh, looking at triglyceride accumulation. So we don't have a practical tool to really dissect what's happening to these fatty liver cows on farm. But some of my uh, early work when I first started here at UW Platteville in collaboration with Dr. Heather White was looking at trying to do a more practical test using blood biomarker, blood biomarker measurements to assess whether or not cows have uh, relatively normal healthy livers or what we call high liver triglyceride as a proxy for fatty liver syndrome. And based on our preliminary results, and I have a fun little graph there pictured in the bottom right, I have two different uh, blood tests that we tried. Uh, the one on the left is at seven days of milk, and the one on the right is at 14 days of milk, and they both have about an 80% balance accuracy for diagnosing cows with high liver triglyceride. So we thought that this could be a very practical solution on farm where we could at least survey uh, cows as they calve in whether or not they have high liver triglyceride or fatty liver syndrome. 
So in order to get an idea of if this is a valuable tool, first we need cows. And that's where I'm very grateful to have had the collaboration with Andy and his team at Stonefront, as well as a couple other producers in southern Wisconsin, having access to cows and lots of awesome data uh, to follow outcomes from our prediction panels. So I guess before I dive too much in the project, I'll invite Andy to talk about uh, his interest in this project and willingness to let this guy come and bleed some of his cows. Uh, good morning, Andy Buttles, uh, Stonefront Farm. Um, my family farms about, four, we milk about 1,400 cows, just about 12 miles away uh, towards Lancaster, a uh, farm about 2,000 acres. I guess ever since I've heard about the Dairy Hub, I kind of thought it was a cool idea, so I've been kind of a proponent of it, so having the opportunity to actually participate has been a, a really good experience. I guess a little background on myself, uh, back in the 90s I was a uh, student at UW-Madison studying dairy science and I was uh, had the opportunity for my college job to work at the Dairy Cattle Center so I think I got to see a lot of different research at that time so it just kind of showed me the importance of it and I do remember one of the trials we were participating in they had to actually do liver biopsies and it was very very not good for the cow. We really like our cows, so when we had the opportunity to maybe partner and find a better way to take care of our cows, we thought it was a good idea. And because uh, with fatty liver and fresh cows, you're, you think you know, but you're not all sure. So what we found in our protocols, we milk about 1,400 cows, so we have enough to get some pretty good numbers. So if we can actually see if that is or isn't what the problem is, it just makes it a lot us uh, makes it a lot easier for us to manage that problem or maybe solve it. So that, I guess that's uh, when they came in this situation, they came to me and said, hey, we need a place to do this. I said, hey, no problem. We'll go ahead. I really appreciated it because their team was really good. Um, we didn't have to provide much extra labor. It was very hands off. They could do their thing. And we kind of figured out ways to mesh it in with what activities we already did with fresh cows on the farm. So it really uh, paired well together and worked very well together. Yeah, so talking about a little bit uh, what the project looked like. So we were able to collect 529 cows, about 170 from Stonefront specifically. And we followed these cows from their dry period through uh, most of their lactation. We did some prepartum uh, body condition scoring. And when you look at the bottom of this slide here, we have a timeline. So negative numbers are when cows are dry, not making milk. Um, about a, three weeks to a month out from calving, we would visit the cows in the uh, dry pen and we do a body condition score. And then the positive numbers are the days after they calve in. And that's when we really started taking our samples. And uh, like Andy pointed out, when we try to organize on-farm projects, a priority for us is that we don't take too much of Andy or his team's time and try to work collaboratively with them as much as possible. So uh, for this project, what we did is cows had about seven days of milk and 14 days of milk uh, during the normal morning lockup uh, when they were doing fresh checks already. Uh, we would draw a vial of blood and on seven days of milk, we would also do a ketone body test uh, for a disorder called ketosis that we're also tracking. and. Uh, when we were done blood sampling, we pack the samples on ice, take them back to the lab, process them, and then run our biomarker panels in the lab to predict uh, high triglyceride status on seven days of milk or 14 days of milk. And then the relevant outcomes that we were monitoring, which again, we're really grateful to have uh, because Andy and his team do a great job keeping electronic records of what's happening to their cows, how they're managed, We've been able to collect weekly backups of their Dairy Comp 305 software, which is a management software that keeps their individual cow records, and see after our diagnosis in the lab with the blood panel, what are the consequences of this high triglyceride status? And just uh, another thing that I like to keep in mind that I learned in my PhD when organizing a, or planning an on-farm project, another thing that I like to do is add value to the project for Andy and his team. So us blood testing for ketone bodies at seven days of milk, that saved 
time and strips for his team and we were able to give him our, our list of cows that had ketosis and he was able to treat while the cows were already locked up. And we have some other side components like genotyping and such that uh, Andy and his team will be able to benefit from down the road too. Now, uh, some preliminary results. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a couple blood panels that we are testing for high triglyceride status. And the black lines are cows that did not have a case of high triglycerides or the black bars too. And the blue are cows diagnosed with this high triglyceride status. And the long and short of it is pictured on the left, we can see that fatty liver or high triglyceride cows did make less milk. And that was uh, definitely the case during the first two test days. So uh, Andy tests uh, milk about once every month. So we get milk weights and milk composition on his cows. And we saw that the cows we diagnosed uh, with the seven day in milk blood panel made 1.8 kilograms or and 1.9 less kilograms less than the quote healthy cows on those test days. And then on the right, we have uh, incidence of other illnesses on farm. Uh, on the left is displaced abomasum, and on the right is metritis, a uterine infection. And using both uh, the seven day milk panel and the 14 day milk panel, we were able to detect differences in the prevalence of other illnesses. So cows that had cases of HTG generally had greater morbidity, more incidence of DA, metritis, and other illnesses than the healthy cows, so to speak, in this data set. So we were really pleased to see that it does seem that our blood panels are picking out cows that are going to have uh, economically relevant adverse consequences that we want to manage against. And then uh, rounding off uh, a little bit about the project, this has been super awesome. And I want to emphasize how grateful we are and how much we can do with these on-farm projects with partners like Andy, because it gives us an opportunity to output and leverage so much, both to our students on campus as well as to the industry. So because of this project and because of Andy and our other partners, we were able to see to help secure or leverage this project for a graduate student assistantship. Uh, Aaron Kamen, who's sitting out in the crowd and presenting a poster on this research, please bother her about it. Uh, 14 other student assistantships uh, at UW-Platteville and UW-Madison. Um, three, uh, three students at UW-Madison, 11 here at UW-Platteville, multiple peer-reviewed abstracts, uh, Aaron has a manuscript in, pro in preparation that we're planning on submitting still this year. We've been able to leverage this data for five grant proposals, uh, one funded USDA, one pending, uh, funded regional grant, and some private grants that are currently pending. 18 research, or excuse me, outreach opportunities ranging from farm visits to producer talks to stakeholder workshops, and many collaborations at UW-Madison, UW-Platteville internally, as well as with uh, scientists at the USDA Dairy Forage Research Center in Madison. So one small project has touched all of these institutions and a lot of students and the dairy industry. And as far as where we're going in the future with this research, uh, we're investigating things like value-added chemistry. If we're gonna go blood, pull blood sample, if I'm gonna convince Andy to pull blood, it needs to be more than just diagnosing high versus low triglycerides. It needs to be like our monthly milk tests where we're getting data and KPIs on the components as well as things like the transition cow index, keto monitor, so that we have additional value for the producer to make the investment. We have what I'm generically calling omics research going on where we're looking at the genetic basis, both from a selection and a gene, so to speak, standpoint for high triglyceride status, uh, collaboration with Dr. Wenli Lee at USDA Dairy Forge, looking at the transcriptome of cows with or without fatty liver or high body condition score loss, 
And we also get a really unique opportunity because we're using real data from real cows that are outside of our uh, more controlled research environment to reevaluate some assumptions that we have about cow metabolism uh, based off of our controlled research, research. And one thing that I'm specifically looking at right now in the data is how these different metabolic disorders uh, co-present and impact the cow. And the main ones being uh, ketosis, fatty liver, uh, high NEFA, high blood fatty acids, cows that typically lose a lot of body weight, and hypoglycemia, low blood sugar cows because surprisingly, no one's actually looked at all those side by side comprehensively. So that's some of the cool stuff that we're doing, all thanks to Andy's collaboration with us. Oh, and then some quick kudos. I have pictures of students. So we have Aaron pictured on the left, memorize that face, she's hiding in the crowd. Uh, <laughs> Again, some of the undergrads, um, we have Aaron Schoen in the top middle, uh, who was working with us previously on a feed component of this research. We have Olivia Adams in the bottom center, who worked a lot with blood sampling and some of the chemistry in lab. And then on the right-hand side, we have uh, Jayla Meeson, who worked a lot uh, spearheading, actually, one of the farms that we were sampling at as part of this project. Okay, again, uh, Stonefront Farm, uh, not far from here. As you can see, we uh, really like our cows, so anything we can do to make that whole experience better is always appreciated. So really with milking cows, you know, the biggest stress is during calving, so if we can do things through this research to kind of get through calving, it just makes everything else easier. If they get through calving good, they milk better, they get bred back, all those great things. So that's really what, I guess, influenced me to uh, participate in this. And like I said earlier, back in the 90s, I was participating in research at uh, the university. And it got me thinking that, like, uh, at that time, I worked at Dairy Cattle Center, so we did a lot of nutrition stuff. So it'd be mixing small batches of feed, measuring way back. Uh, Dr. Eineman back there, he was doing some really cool stray voltage uh, research at that time, I believe. So it was some stuff that we needed right away. But then there were some other things. Like I remember uh, there was a young uh, reprophys professor Milo Wiltbank and he had these crazy ideas he wanted to pull blood on cows and monitor them and now that's become um, OVSync and resync and all the protocols that like all of us use now so it just shows that you know some research is short term some is a little long term and you don't know because even Dr. Wiltbank's research right now if you think about it if you make reproduction better uh, you really reduce our carbon footprint which is kind of a big deal right now so you know, some of this research we have to look really carefully like, oh, the immediate impact, but I think we also have to look more long term and just, you know, some research you kind of have to just figure things out and you, it might not be immediately applied, but down the road it might really be pretty cool. I guess some other things we do uh, through the Dairy Hub, uh, working with uh, Dennis Bush, we do a lot of really cool uh, uh, stuff out in the fields. So this is a picture of an airplane that we were doing some seeding with. And we uh, seeded some different fields for different projects. And uh, these are some tillage radishes and winter triticale. So besides uh, pairing with the hub in this project, we also do a lot of things out in the fields with cover crops uh, and, and really cool environmental things. Uh, the, the fencing project, I think that's cool because like uh, others said, if we could keep cattle out of certain... Uh, in southwest Wisconsin, you know, it's just kind of hard to fence. So if we could keep cattle out of uh, certain environmentally uh, sensitive areas, man, that'd be, a, that'd be a huge benefit. Plus, in a lot of these pastures in this part of the state, you just can't, it's hard to rotate because of like trees and underbrush. If we could do that, uh, I thought that was just a really great idea. So you, sometimes you just don't know, you know, it's not always like, oh, I have this problem, I have to find it. Sometimes we need to do some research just to kind of figure some stuff out, I think, so. Uh, with that, I think uh, we'll take any questions, either on the project or other things or whatever we got. I did have a question for you guys. Um, how does the blood panel test, and I think specifically the triglyceride, is what you had referenced that you were looking there. Can you articulate how that differentiates between a normal BHB test or your like DHI keto test? How, how is that? 
Uh, what's the advantage to looking at that differently? Absolutely. So um, when we test blood ketone bodies, what we're usually doing is we're trying to diagnose a disorder called ketosis, hyperketonemia, high blood ketones. It is a illness that is thought to be comorbid, co-occurring with fatty liver. And it, we have shown that it does have an impact on cows as well with greater morbidity incidence, uh, lower p- production, fertility issues. Uh, for this blood biomarker panel, instead of diagnosing hyperketonemia, we're predicting the actual liver triglycerides. So that's the main difference in what trying to dissect out what higher liver triglycerides means for the cow not just uh, ketosis. And actually, while in our data set we did have uh, high triglyceride cows and and ketotic cows present at the same time, so they had both illnesses, the the overlap was actually less than 50%. So we actually had cows that were uniquely uh, fatty liver and cows that were uniquely ketosis. So that's part of that uh, last bit of research there where we're trying to reevaluate are these disorders as co-presenting, as co-morbid as we think they are in real cows. Maybe fatty liver cows are something unique and maybe ketotic cows are something unique instead of overly similar illnesses. So I have a quick question as well. I'm a little bit sleep deprived, so I may have just missed this. Um, but so how does this affect the cows? Like, is it just, do they produce less milk because of fatty liver? Does it affect the meat? Like, what, what are we finding here other than comorbidity and lack of milk production? So, yeah, it would be reducing. The, the main economic uh, consequences would be reduced milk production and greater other illness incidents. Um, in terms of like mechanism of impact, so the accumulation of fat in the liver is going to actually potentially damage the cells of the liver itself. So the cells themselves get fat. It can be compression of the uh, machinery within the sh- cells and the work they do. And there's been some in vitro work to suggest that things like Uh, gluconeogenesis, which is really important in dairy cows, especially after calving, might be inhibited, as well as uh, greater risk of things like cirrhosis, so actual damage of the liver and scarring of the liver, too. So there's both economic output consequences as well as real biological consequences underlying. This research isn't addressing that mechanistic biology as much as uh, looking at translationally in an applied way how this disease is impacting cows on farm economically. All right, let's thank our speakers. Uh, Sorry guys, just one one second. Stop, Andy. (laughs) Sorry, I just looked at the chat online. And um, we did get one question for you, Andy. What strategies does Andy use to prevent fatty liver, liver, excuse me, and are those applied to all of your cows? So our biggest strategy is our pre-fresh ration. So we really tried nutritionally to be as proactive as we can. But again, it's, it's a hard thing because fatty liver cows, you, you kind of guess they are, but you don't really know how many you have, what a stage of that. So you always have some cows that freshen that just don't do well. And so it's easy to say it's this or that. And you don't really know, but a lot of times I think it can be a fatty liver cow. Because fatty liver cows, they'll never reach their full potential. They'll just kind of kind of just hang out there, and they just really don't come into their milk well. And it's just kind of a lost lactation a lot of times. But it's kind of hard to know if it is a fatty liver cow or not. So this research, at least, I think allows us to know. Because it's kind of hard to... For treatment, there's not a lot of good treatment options, so prevention is great. I mean, in an ideal world, you don't let them get too heavy, and that helps a lot. But in the real world, that tends to happen once in a while. So it is for right now, our best uh, option is nutritionally. But like I say, this could lead to a lot of better, better options. And actually knowing if it is this or if it is something else 
to know how to treat. It's hard to treat something you don't know if it is or not. 